ask if there is uh, some uh, question at the beginning. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Rosana Coraza. I'm from the PCT also, uh, a colleague of uh, André Furtado. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, for the uh, very stimulating presentation, Professor Bill Bonvillia. Uh, I, I was thinking about legacy sectors and how they are relevant in terms of job creation and protection and perhaps even recovering of natural environment. I would say that face social conflict and environmental crisis in future, um, perhaps it will be necessary if not urgent to design entirely some legacy sectors like agriculture, food production, transports and energy. And uh, I like it very much also, uh, like Professor Mariano Maplani, uh, your East-West metaphor. Uh, I would ask you a question that have to do with the extra system factors, uh, those you have called the innovation context. Uh, could you please develop a little bit more on that subject? and uh, perhaps giving us examples on how to consider in research and policy contexts. And uh, um, I would like to, to pose a, another question, if I, I may, um, to Professor Mariano. I like very much, Mariano, your appropriation from Professor Bonvillian is to his metaphor. And uh, um, I was thinking about the use you propose to, to apply it to our context in Brazil and uh, to see the development of some sectors uh, which we, uh, we, we may uh, look as very innovative or um, the, um, uh, the example that Professor Von, Otter, Von Otter gave us from agro sugarcane agroindustry, uh, where we, we constructed um, uh, innovation systems, uh, uh, as Professor André Furtado shows us. Um, I was um, seeing something which I like to share with you, perhaps in a bit provocative way. Ethanol agroindustry. And uh, another uh, sector, um, bankery uh, informatization, are two sectors where Brazilian, Brazilians have accomplished very uh, high innovative uh, initiatives. But they are, they are East in the way you see it. Uh, uh, let me t explain a little bit. Uh, uh, we have uh, those uh, uh, vested interests in those sectors, in both of them. They, are, uh, they carry with them our uh, worst inheritance, socially speaking, culturally speaking. So, um, uh, we um, I see we are doing our way on West, but deepening our roots, uh, our roots on East. Uh, that, 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 this is a, a thought that I would share with you, and um, uh, if you, if you please. A comment on this, I would be very well uh, welcome. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Let me go to your to your first of your two very good questions. Uh, just to summarize briefly, you know, the the concept was that. In the U.S., the science and technology policy field really focuses on looking at the innovation system, of looking at the actors in that system, the institutions, um, the researchers, uh, that 
you know, create the technological opportunities and the technical capacity that can lead to, to new technological innovations. Uh, but when you get into dealing with legacy sectors, I mean, that works in an open field. That works in an east to west model because you don't have to worry about many of these other factors. You're opening new territory, right? But in a legacy sector model, you really have to worry about a second factor, this innovation context. And, you know, different societies have different, you know, elements that make up this context. I mean, just to take one, and, and you asked for an example, um, you know, one feature in the U.S. system that is a positive feature for innovation is an acceptance in our society of failure. We are willing to tolerate people who have created startups and failed. And in fact, um, those who have had several failures, we could call them serial entrepreneurs in the US, uh, that have failed several times are actually considered to have had very important experiences and less likely to repeat their problems and therefore able to attract you know, venture funding in a way in which the first starter you know, with less experience is less able to do. So this turns out to be an advantage a cultural advantage uh, in an innovation system where you want your innovators to accept risk, right? But obviously there's features in the U.S. that are negative kind of factors. So for example, the U.S. has got a spotty education system. Innovation requires a, a tremendously strong talent base um, and the U.S. has developed, you know, strong research-based universities but we have a very mixed system in our K through 12 education process that's particularly problematic in too many schools on science and technology education. Um, so that's a, a, a socio factor, a social factor that's a problem in the innovation context in the US. It's an underlying issue. So those are just a couple of examples. There are economic examples, there are political examples because the context is big, right, uh, that can be problems in undertaking innovation. I hope that clears that some of that up. Mariano, do you want to make a, okay, I think it worked. Well, <laughs> it, would, it would take a long time to, to, to discuss this, but I think you, you, you had a point. You had a point. And, um, you're right, we, we did some uh, breakthroughs in uh, building innovation systems and innovative environments in sectors which are um, examples of our past <laughs> history of inequality. And, and, uh, but I think this, this clearly um, reinforces uh, the point that was made before, that innovation is not something about technological breakthroughs only. It has to do with social change, building new structures. And this is difficult when you can't easily change power structure. So why are one, some of the best examples of our capacity to build environments, innovative environment, why are they linked to the East? Because there's power there, there are capabilities there accumulated over time that enable us to do some things that we cannot do in other uh, sectors of our economy where we don't have those resources. Yeah. But having said this, you also have to uh, take into account that some of these old legacy sectors that carry this long history of injustice, inequality, um, uh, can change, and there's, there, there's very, there are very striking differences between the way you produced sugar from sugarcane or even ethanol from sugarcane 30 years ago compared to the way you do it today. Um, so if you look at the sugarcane production in the 80s. It was uh, 
the harvesting was done with uh, manual, uh, low skilled, poorly paid workers. That's not the way you produce second generation ethanol. We're not even talking about the same plant. It's no longer sugar cane. It's energy cane. It's a different vegetable. <laughs> it's a different plant. So the working conditions are different. We, we are still trying to get some new chemical processes to, build, to, to, to produce ethanol. Not as a byproduct of sugar, but as a byproduct of biomass. So even in this highly uh, traditional legacy sector, you can bring change, technological and uh, business, business structure change and social change. It's not easy. <laughs> I wish we could do the same in health, as I said before, public transportation, uh, housing. Um, but that doesn't mean we, cannot, we, we should not attempt and succeed in doing it in the traditional sectors, traditionally in the other sense, in the East sense, Eastern sense. Uh, is there more questions? Well, I, I can uh, ask some question, perhaps. Uh, uh, one is uh, direct for Bill, no? because uh, uh, after, okay. Uh, one is direct for Bill, because uh, when you talk about uh, these five steps of uh, science and technology, and uh, you, you talk about this uh, fourth step, because uh, which is the uh, analyzing gaps or how to fill the gaps, no? and you 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 told us about uh, the the role of ARPA, no E, no? and uh, also the Advanced Manufacturing Institute, uh, and I, as far as I can understand, uh, United States create uh, several mechanisms to to uh, make this kind of policy. Uh, but uh, it seems in your presentation that uh, the, the success of uh, filling this gap wasn't uh, really fulfilled in the American experience. And uh, you, you made some comparison, international comparison with, uh, especially with Germany and uh, maybe with Japan. And uh, I, I would like to understand if they, they have uh, been more successful in this uh, kind of uh, step four uh, science and technology policy. If you think this, in, in, in why they, they have uh, done this. No? Uh, and uh, I, I have uh, another question for uh, Nick, uh, no? because uh, uh, um, he make uh, a very instigating comments about uh, Petrobras and uh, uh, ethanol <laughs> policy. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, I would like to make some comments about this because uh, I think these uh, legacy sectors, they have a, a very important role in the innovation in Brazil. No? It's, it's, maybe it's different from a developed country because uh, here they are really uh, competitive, more competitive sectors. They, uh, when they realize uh, R&D, they have the level much more close to what uh, is done in developed countries. No? So uh, it seems that in these sectors, we have uh, more opportunities to make catch up or to uh, leapfrog uh, developed countries. And, and the question is why we can do this? No? Why we, we are not so much successful in this intent? So? And uh, I think uh, in the, especially in the area of ethanol, no? we, can, we can see. But uh, wh what is the, the reason? Because I think uh, e even in ethanol or in oil, we, our advance in knowledge is much more based in incremental innovation. We, we don't have a really frontier 
technology innovation. And uh, in this sense, our uh, science and technology policy, because uh, as I told, we, we have created uh, several mechanisms to uh, improve the innovation in this sector, funds, uh, new mechanisms to, uh, but uh, they are really uh, direct toward uh, maintaining the same technology behavior and, and not to uh, try to improve in disruptive innovation. And uh, uh, in, the, in the case of uh, second generation uh, uh, ethanol, which is uh, now we see now Brazil it's intended, but still our science and technology policy, for example, with the National Development Bank, is to bring from outside this technology, not so much to develop it inside the country. So it's the case of Putin, because what we are doing in the second generation, we are bringing a lot of foreign players to Brazil, no? and not so much putting our own national players that are still very weak in, the, in this effort. No? So uh, here you, you can see, and the, the mechanism of funding, they are also very limited no? in, in the way to intend to uh, attract more uh, uh, disruptive innovation made locally. No? So, well, uh, I would ask to Bill to, to answer. Andre, thank you for that for that uh, that good question. So, so let's let's talk about manufacturing for a minute and really focus on that because that's really what you're raising. Um, you know, the U.S. allowed its system to slip and went through a significant decline in manufacturing employment, in actually output declines for the first time in U.S. history for part of that 2000 to 2010 period. Um, if there's output decline, and that meant that we weren't getting the productivity gains that we thought we were getting. Um, and there was a, a decline in, in investment in capital plants and equipment um, that actually continues to now, right? That hasn't caught back up yet. So these are really serious indicators of a decline in that sector. And Germany, as you suggest, turned out to provide a very interesting model to the US. So most Americans thought that because the U.S. is a high-wage, high-cost country, we had to lose manufacturing to lower-cost, lower-wage countries, and that it was going to go, right, in a painful inevitability. But then we began looking at Germany, and German manufacturing wages are actually 60% higher than U.S. manufacturing wages. They have 20% of their economy in manufacturing. The United States has about 12%. What are they doing, right? They're supposed to lose this. What, what's going on there? So we began to take a close look uh, at elements that had been established in the German manufacturing sector that managed to create a situation where it wasn't only running, the country wasn't only reigning a significant surplus, trade surplus in manufactured goods. It was also running a significant trade surplus in manufactured goods with China. Right? where our U.S. has a gigantic deficit. So what are their lessons to be learned there for a high-cost, high-wage economy being very successful in manufacturing? So we began to look at some of the institutional elements, and there are many, but just to mention a couple, one is that they have Fraunhofer Institutes where they bring together small and mid-sized manufacturers and the German system of Mittelstadt manufacturers, strong mid-sized manufacturers is a core key part of their system. And they get a lot, they develop common strategies together and provide each other a lot of supporting background knowledge, best practice information. Uh, and then they bring in universities, particularly on the engineering side, to work together on technological advances in their production processes. So the US, saw the importance of these kinds of collaborative institutions in creating a real culture around manufacturing that bring, brought together critical players and exactly the same kind of collaborative model you were talking about, Professor. Uh, another thing that Germany did, which doesn't fit with the United States, right? So Germany is heavily unionized in the manufacturing sector. The US no longer is, uh, but it had a very strong apprenticeship and training program. 
So you can't introduce innovation unless you have a workforce that understands it, right? And they had developed a very, very strong training system to do this. So the U.S. looked at those two examples from Germany and thought, gee, can we do something somewhat similar along these lines? And then looking to that kind of five-step process that I talked about earlier, you know, in the first step, you're going to have to do some innovation, right? If you're going to change a sector and if you want to introduce advanced manufacturing in the U.S., there's going to have to be some innovations to do it. So the U.S. found that it wasn't really doing R&D on manufacturing, manufacturing process. We're doing a lot of R&D on relevant things, but wasn't applying that to manufacturing. So we began to think about creating manufacturing institutes that were a little different than the Fraunhofer model, but very focused on developing a new generation, a new set of technology paradigms around production. Um, and I, you know, I mentioned a couple of them, but around advanced materials, around digital so-called smart production, maybe around mass customization, which involves 3D printing and computer-driven equipment. Um, there's a series of these that are potentially out there. We've been thinking about, could there be, you know, fibers have been the same for about 4,000 years. It's still cotton that Egypt figured out 4,000 years ago. Maybe we can have fibers that did all kinds of other things, right? Maybe we can have fibers that were our cell phones, that were our computers that we would talk to, right? Maybe there's a whole different way of embedding knowledge into fibers that would create a whole new sector, right? So there were, there were a lot of wild ideas out there, but some very important core ideas. And could we create manufacturing institutes like these Fraunhofer's that would start to nurture these technologies, but in an environment that brought together university research with some government matching funds, with strong large firms and small and middle-sized firms, and maybe these new institutions, right? And this is step four and five. We didn't do any of this. That helps fill a gap in our innovation system. And then further, on the training side, maybe these institutes could also help in training a workforce, particularly taking advantage of online tools and blended learning, to start getting the skill sets out that are going to be needed in these new advanced manufacturing sectors. So this is kind of the way in which to apply that kind of five-step process that looks at the innovation step in one, but really thinks about the market launch in a community of the actors working together and doing strategies together, um, and then fills the innovation gap as part of that. So that's kind of what the U.S. is up to on this advanced manufacturing front. May, may, may I have a word yeah. on, on, on this? Uh, on the question, the comment you uh, 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 sent my way. Um, um, uh, these big companies that we were talking about, of course, uh, they, they have a particular role in, in our economy. And, 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 and in these sectors, the role they have is that they are integrators. The small companies cannot integrate many things. They don't have the, the, the capability. Uh, they can come up with the, with, with the idea, but then how you really uh, expand it is, is, is a problem. So we need them. And it's not, uh, I don't want to, I know Petrobras has gotten a lot of uh, <laughs> bad press recently here. Uh, but uh, uh, Petrobras is, is actually, um, in some respects, a very good company. It has accomplished technologically significant steps. You, your paper um, um, shows that Petrobras, uh, uh, when Brazil started uh, uh, feeling that there is a large deposit out there, out of Rio, in the uh, Rio Basin of oil, Petrobras really lagged very far behind in the technologies of deep sea drilling. So other companies, foreign companies, were way ahead of it. Uh, and, then, and then with very creative strategy, actually, it, uh, it managed to come to the forefront. Right now, Petrobras is at the front line of ability to, to actually go four kilometers down and, and extract uh, oil from that. Not, not many companies around the world can do this, right? So that's good. The thing, the thing is that, that, that this is a sector that is a legacy sector. So Petrobras, as you said, and, and all companies like this will make the steps necessary to continue, uh, if they are successful, to continue in, in their uh, sector, in the given sector where they have the big investments. They will not do the same to disrupt the sector. 
They will not go outside their comfort zone to, to, to bring completely new, new technology. Only small companies uh, will do that. Uh, again, um, it is, uh, it, these, are, these are issues that the best minds around the world are working <laughs> now um, on, on how actually you will manage the small companies to, to, to work with the large companies. Um, uh, some of the most innovative things actually that I know of is, is now large companies trying to disrupt themselves, right? but in a controlled way. This is an amazing thing. So, so, so they, they, they understand that is that it's difficult for 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 really new things, uh, ideas to come up from within the company. So, for example, we have issues like um, corporate venture capital, where an idea comes up. Um, it cannot be funded. It is not winning over the very strict financial requirements of the corporation, right? Uh, it looks very risky. It looks long term. It doesn't fly. But somebody recognizes that this may have a, a, a chance. So what they do, they try to spin out the, the, the idea, um, fund it uh, initially a little bit, but really take the guy or the whatever, uh, or, or either gender, that, that has the idea, say, okay, you, you believe very much in this idea, very good. Go out of the company, you're fired, basically. You're out of this company now, and, and here is a, a little money. You go out there and you try to, to, to build your idea, since you believe so much in this, right? It's, it's the greatest thing. So they, they are sending them out. Um, these people, most of them die, um, as always, is, is with innovation. Most of them fail, but some succeed. And then if something succeeds, and if it looks like it's growing, and it's, it's going to be viable, and, and actually not very dangerous for the big corporation, they bring them back in. This is a very, this is a, 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 a relatively new way of disrupting yourself in a controlled way, however, <laughs> not, not uncontrollably. <laughs> Which is okay, okay, I mean, totally. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to open for new, for questions. Uh, maybe uh, we have a, a round, uh, several questions, and after we have a collective answer, okay? Uh, here in Brazil, we've, uh, alongside the big guys and the big business, we've got some problem with regulation to make, to push this innovation into the market. Uh, we have a lot of bureaucracy and the institutions responsible for making this bureaucracy are very inefficient. In the United States, how, how come you make this environment so that this innovation can uh, can be born. Uh, how do you think? How do you think we could uh, bring that here? The, um, that's my question. It's from Phil. No? Make it uh, and, uh, tell your name. Uh, your name and, uh, uh, my name is Daniel. In your position, your student, uh, I'm an undergraduate here at Unicamp. <clears throat> um, it works. It works. It works. It works. Um, um, I actually, uh, I can tell you. I, I can start from my experience. So I'm a foreigner uh, here. Uh, I, I I I got an award. I got this grant from your your agency. So uh, it was internationally competitive. Uh, we got this significant funding uh, to set up this uh, thing. And then the difficulty started. That was the easy part. The difficulty started after we received the money. Um, there was significant, it took me about six months to get an RNE number from your federal police. I can tell you that if I was a business, if I was trying to invest my money in Brazil, I would be gone, just from that thing. Um, that the, your federal police took six months to give me an RNE number. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, uh, so investors will not wait so much because next door is Colombia, next door is uh, some other country that are, is waiting for the, for the money. 
Um, so if you, if you look at the international rankings of countries, uh, uh, we have now different organizations create these lists that all investors abroad look at when they are started thinking where to invest. They, they look at those lists, um, like the World Bank creates a list that is called doing business in somewhere. Do you know where Brazil ranks? Below 100. I mean, this is, this is after all the number seven or eight economy in the world, and, and ranks so low in terms of how easy it is to do business. So I'm a foreigner, I know nothing about Brazil, right? I, I look, uh, I am interested to invest somewhere to do, I look at this and say, oh no, no, this is, this is impossible. Um, then you hear, you hear people talk uh, about Brazil. Everybody loves Brazil. Nice weather, nice people, nice uh, fun, you know, big market, big everything. But everybody gets stuck. The, the word has gone around that Brazil is very difficult to do business. It's not friendly to business, Brazil. Mexico, on the other hand, has changed that impression now. Mexico is changing that impression. So Mexico is, is coming a, a, a across abroad as being much friendlier. And Colombia, of all places, much friendlier than Brazil to businesses. This is important for you. I mean, this is, nobody can help in this. You really need to, to, to take a look at what's going on and why so much bureaucracy in, in, in uh, yeah, checks, of course, you need to, to check and you need to, but there is no need for, for all this. So that is, that is very, very interesting. Yesterday we had this event um, in FAPESPI actually. Yesterday we were again in FAPESPI in Sao Paulo and we had a, a, a thing. And, and, and I said that if, if you ask me, uh, coming from the outside, an outsider looking in, right? My honest opinion is that the, 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 the country doesn't have many I mean, I don't know, but we, we heard something, but, but, uh, but the big ones that I face is this, the everyday bureaucracy, right? And um, I see the instability in the government up there. It doesn't matter which party, does, the, the, the party doesn't matter at all. What matters is to have stability up there. And the reason is because I, from abroad, I will look there and say, ah, if it is unstable, I don't know, who knows? I mean, who knows what happens um, tomorrow? If I am to do long-term investment in the country, I need to have some certainty, some guarantees that, that um, things will be the same way. Hmm? So, so this, this risk, you must understand the people who put their money at stake because it's good for us here to sit down and, and, and talk like this. But when we put a lot of money on the, on the, on the table, um, we are not going to do this uh, uh, if, 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 if we are very uncertain about what happens next day. I mean, we are going to go elsewhere. Um, where they give us guarantees, better guarantees that, that, that uh, uh, there is some, we want to take the risk of the business. The business risk, the investor will take. But the investor should not be made to take all these other extra costs um, that are out there. This is the, the, the issue, right? So I, I see a country here that is really has a lot of, of, of abilities and a lot of resources. I mean, the country is rich, is absolutely rich, is full of resources. Eh? But it has this, this kind of general, general, uh, issues. Um, some of these issues uh, may be because you, you, you are in the process of development. You know, I mean, you, you did very fast, as we heard. It was very fast, and of course, there are gaps on the way, and, and they will be fixed, but, but they need to be fixed. Okay. Uh, more questions? Uh, uh, my name is Alan, I'm an undergraduate here at phys in physics, and I'd like to address my question to Professor Bonvillian. Uh, it's quite simple, actually. What are your, your, like, your expectations for next year's uh, perspectives in, in, in these polities? Uh, 
regarding like the USA and the present elections. I only work in science and technology policy. <laughs> no, but you know, getting back to something you know, I was talking about earlier, which is this whole problem with the manufacturing sector in the US, it's been very disruptive to the social system in the US. And there are you know, a number of reasons why you know, this odd figure, Donald Trump, has come to the forefront of US politics. But one of the underlying reasons is that really for the first time in US history, you know, exception perhaps in the 1930s depression, there's been a decline in the size of the middle class, right? So growth in the upper middle class, um, unfortunately growth in a, in a lower class, but a real decline in kind of a working class in America. So that manufacturing sector was a tremendous key forward to a large part of the population starting at the end of World War II. Um, a lot of people moved in that into that sector, and these were well-paying jobs that enabled them to anchor their families and get their kids educated in the middle class. And that picture is not as pretty as it was. There is a decline in actual middle-income class uh, earnings in the United States. And a lot of what we're seeing in the politics of the United States, which has created more ideological parties driven to both extremes, right? and a level of anxiety in the, in the population and real disruption, not only the political parties, but of social systems and social assurances. Uh, the US, until fairly recently, thought it, itself was just one monster middle class country, right? With some problems that have to be wrestled with, but that's the way we thought of ourselves. Now we're having to see that it's more complicated than that. So a part of the story around this Trump candidacy is a, in a way, a cry of anxiety from a significant part of our population that has been hit by the changes <clears throat> in the economy, in the innovation economy including, um, that have been really quite disruptive. So, you know, I do think that both political parties see this and are gonna have to address some of these issues, right? They can't, they, both parties have now been disrupted and they can't walk away from this. It's, a, it's an important segment of, of, uh, of the political base, and we'll have to address it. Uh, but meantime, we're going through this big, anxious, painful, and somewhat dangerous political election. So, so, so may I, um, since you are thinking about these things, I will not talk about Mr. Trump, but I will talk about innovation policies and how you can put what Bill said into perspective. So there is a, um, a, a sort of a school of thinking, uh, primarily in Europe, that, that, that has classified uh, the, all the policies uh, of a country, let's say, into three categories. A very easy categories to understand. Even a, a simple-minded politician can, can understand that. So it is the policies that, that uh, push for change. So they, they create pressure to change. And policies like that is open trade, you introduce competition somehow, pressure on the industry to change, right? Um, so often industry these days will, will go towards innovation uh, in order to, 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 to salvage itself from, from this, this com competition. Then a second class of policies is the policies that assist industry to change. So you understand? So you put pressure for change, then you assist the industry to change. I mean, and that's where innovation policy, the types of things we are discussing here, that's where they, they, they go. And then there is a third class of policies, separate altogether. You, you, you take care of the losers from change. Do you understand this? In any sort of change, any sort of innovation, we are talking about change, they will be losers. And this is what Bill is referring to. So there are some people who lose from any change. Um, so the question is whether our societies can afford actually to let them get lost, <laughs> really. Uh, or or we, we, we actually, since when we advocate for change, because all of us advocate for change here, and I think you, 
Um, um, we also need to pay attention from those who fall on the Y side, you know, on the side of the street, and, and they cannot really pick it up. Um, uh, this, I think, will become more and more important. Uh, the Europeans are much better than, in my opinion, this is my opinion, um, uh, much better than the Americans in this respect. Um, they are much more sensitive, and not because they are better people, but because they came first. So the Europeans industrialized long before the United States. So they have experienced this problem for a long time. Um, industries just disappearing, and, and then the uh, countries having to pick up the pieces. Um, uh, so the Europeans are, are, are very, very careful with, uh, with this issue, and you can see it actually in Europe uh, in particular places. Um, I tell you, next time you go to Europe, try to go to a, a city that is called Maastricht. Maastricht is the place where, where a big treaty was signed in Europe. Uh, it's at the tip of the Netherlands into Belgium. Um, and when you go there, not only you will see a beautiful town, one of the best places you've ever been, uh, extreme, as if you are in a postcard, actually. Um, very, very interesting. But it has a lot of industry, all clean, all clean. There is not even a single smokestack. But try also to go there to a history place and see how this, this place was. If you see the pictures of this place from the 50s, you will not really believe that it's the same area. It's dark, it's bleaky, it's full of, 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 of smokestacks, it's, it's, it's a lot of, 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 of bad stuff around, ugly, uh, people uneducated, uh, blue-collar workers all everywhere on the streets. You look today and you don't believe what you see in front of you. The whole region, it's a, it's a whole region called Limburg, the, the, the region of Limburg, has been turned around completely. Right? So we must be able to do these things. Um, if we want to move ahead, we must be able to do these things. And, 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 and as I said, the, the, there, is, there are people who are thinking very actively to this. Part of the innovation policy must be what we will do with those who will lose on the back. And this is what we are experiencing right now in the United States. Right? Uh, just to add one complexity to the to the whole story, even even additional complexity. What we're, de what we're dealing here is something uh, maybe not new for us in Brazil, but certainly new for the U.S. and maybe in Europe. No? Uh, from the beginning, we get used to dealing with companies in manufacturing, companies which were uh, foreign-owned, companies which ha followed in Brazil strategies established elsewhere, and their, at their head companies. Um, for good and for <laughs> not so good, we're used to this. This is not the case in the US or in Europe, because they, their companies went abroad, but their head companies remained in their original countries. This has changed in the last 30, 40 years, because uh, even when the US companies still have their headquarters in the US, not all of them, because some of them, for tax reasons, have moved their headquarters elsewhere. But even those who remained, who still had their headquarters in the US, earn most of their money, or a large part of their money, in the global economy. So aligning, bringing together profit strategies from global companies and national interests of societies and governments is not as easy as it used to be for developed countries. It was never easy for us. We're used to this. It's a tension you have to take into account. It doesn't change easily. For developed countries, this is a new challenge, an additional challenge. 
I don't know exactly how this problem is um, seen from within, from within the US, from within Europe. But um, this is certainly something new, you know? bringing back uh, the assets that American companies have in Asia is not, is not simple. As well as uh, bringing back the assets that European companies have in the US is not simple. So it's, we're dealing with global manufacturing now, which is, has uh, some good things <laughs> to say it in favor, but also bring this complexity. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, we we reach our time now. Uh, I don't know if you I have, have an a, announcement. A nose. Well, I, I, I have. I would like to make my acknowledgments for this uh, really instigating session. I, 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 especially for Bill, who uh, has uh, show his uh, book and his ideas, uh, very interesting. Uh, this metaphor you know, that you show us from east to west uh, is very instigating. We, we need to think more about this in Brazil. No? Uh, and uh, well, uh, I, I acknowledge everyone who came here. I'd like to thank and um, uh, I give the last word to, to Nick. Um, thank you, thank you very much for, for being with us and, and because I see a lot of students in the audience, I wanted to make an announcement. Um, if, um, uh, if you like the kinds of discussions that we are having uh, this morning here, uh, I would strongly recommend, I would invite you actually to participate in this activity that uh, we have uh, in the Department for Science and Technology Policy. The department is part of the uh, uh, Geosciences Institute. Um, we don't do geosciences, we do science and technology policy. Uh, not, 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 not actual technology, actually, only the policy. Um, but this, is, this, is, um, <clears throat> this activity is called Innovation Systems, Strategy and Policy. There is a website for it. Um, um, the website is very difficult for me to read now, but I can. It's www.com ige.unicampi.brazil/spec spec São Paulo Excellence Chair for for that. So if you go there, you will see news, you will see conferences. Next year we are going to have a big conference here in in uh, on campus. We are going to have also a, a, a workshop. Um, we have uh, also event of direct interest to many of you to some of you, uh, and perhaps some of your friends who were not here today, and I wish that you go out and tell people, so your parents have paid us money, um, and we have money to give out to you. Uh, so it's so simple. Um, it's very simple, I, th I, I think you understand this language. We have money uh, in the, in the and, and we want good students we want good candidates to come take the money. Um, so this is, this is the Sao Paulo taxpayers' money. <laughs> All right, so the Paulistas have paid this money, which is your parents, whoever, uh, and, 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 and here we are to give it out to you. The only thing that we do is our selection. We, we are the selection mechanism. Um, so we will select some people to give out money. We have already people, uh, they are in this room, some of them, one just left. And we have postdoc students and, 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 and we are hiring now. If you go to this website, you will see that we have a position open and another position may come out soon. Um, these are internationally competitive positions so, so FAPESPI, uh, if you apply for this, you will compete with people from abroad uh, sometimes, um, uh, uh, but you are fully covered as a postdoc uh, student, and, and you will be attached to some of my colleagues and me uh, to work together. We work only in English. Uh, it's by definition, uh, first because I, I, I don't speak Portuguese, but that, 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 that's, not, that's, that's, not, that's not the case. That's not the reason. The reason is that actually 
your agency, FAPESPI, um, uh, wants this to happen in order for, for the publications that will come out of this to go to international ranked journals. We want to go high, right? Um, so, so this activity has been going on for almost two years now. Um, it's going to go on for three more. Um, uh, and we have several positions for PhDs so doctoral positions, we have several actually, uh, five, six. Um, uh, uh, the only limitation that FAPESPI put to us is, is that we only support people who go directly from undergraduate to PhD. So if you have a master's, we cannot support you, but uh, you can link to the group. Uh, you are very welcome to link to us and go on the website and participate and do whatever. Simply we cannot give uh, because uh, the funding agency does not allow this. But if you are already the masters but you have not qualified yet, you are eligible. So you may be in the masters but not finished yet. And then there is a mechanism to turn uh, from the masters to go to the PhD. So several positions for doctoral studies. Uh, so tell to your friends, just spread it around the university, we really want good people. Actually spread it around to any university in Brazil. Anybody, anybody can participate, anyone, no matter where they come from, right? We want the best people and we have a few positions for postdoctoral, okay? Um, and that is uh, uh, fully supported with uh, Generously, I think it's a generous, whatever the FAPSP gives is, is good. And, and in that case, we also cover relocation expenses. So somebody who will move, let's say, from Minas Gerais here, or will move from Colombia here, or will move from France here, um, we cover the relocation expenses um, for them to, to come live in Brazil. So, okay, I, I just wanted to, 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 to say this and with you know, scream um, and say, we wait for you and for your friends to, to, send, to send applications in. Um, things are open now. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, the name of this project is INSISPO. No, it's, uh, it's the easy way to, to find it. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Mariano Laplane, uh, Nicholas von Orte, and Bill Bovillian for this excellent uh, 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 event we have. Thank you very much. <laughs>